from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. As you well know by now, the cloud is about shifting IT labor to more strategic initiatives, or as Andy Jassy laid out years ago, removing the undifferentiated heavy lifting associated with deploying and managing IT infrastructure. Cloud is also about changing the operating model and rapidly scaling a business operation or a company. Often overlooked with cloud, however, is the innovation piece of the puzzle. A main source of that innovation is venture funded startup companies that have brilliant technologists who are mission driven and have a vision to solve really hard problems and enter a large market at scale to disrupt it. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we're pleased to welcome a special guest and author of the Elite 80, a report that details the hottest privately held cybersecurity and IT infrastructure companies in the world. Eric Suppinger is that author and joins us today from JMP Securities. Eric, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Dave. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to having a discussion here with you. Yeah, me too. This is going to be great. So let's dive right into the Elite 80. First, if you could tell us about JMP Securities and fill us in on the report, its history, your approach to picking the 80 companies out of thousands of choices. Sure, so uh, JMP is a, um, a middle markets investment bank. We're a, a full service investment bank uh, based in San Francisco. Uh, we were founded in 2000 and we focus on um, technology, healthcare, uh, financial services and, uh, and real estate. Um, I've been with JMP since 2011. Um, I've, uh, I, I cover uh, cybersecurity companies, public companies. Uh, I cover uh, IT infrastructure companies uh, more broadly. And um, we have, having been based here in San Francisco, I've long kept uh, a good dialogue with uh, private companies uh, that, that compete with the public companies that I cover. And so um, about seven years ago, I, uh, I started uh, developing this, uh, this report, which is really designed to highlight uh, emerging uh, private companies that, uh, that I think are, uh, are well positioned to be leaders in their respective markets. And, uh, and over time, we've, um, we've built the list up to about 80 companies and, uh, and we publish this report every year. Uh, it's designed to uh, to keep tabs on uh, on the companies that are doing well, and uh, and we rotate about uh, about fifteen to twenty to twenty five percent of the companies uh, out of the report every year, either as they get acquired or they do an IPO or um, uh, they uh, they if if we think that they are slowing and others are getting a little bit more uh, more exciting. And you talk directly to the companies. That's part of your methodology as well. You do a lot of background research, digging yep. into to funding, but you also talk to the executives at these companies, correct? Yes, for the most part, we, uh, we try to talk to the CEOs, uh, at least the CFOs. Um, the object here is to build a, uh, a relationship with these companies so that we have some good insights into, uh, into how they're doing and, uh, and how the market trends are evolving as they relate to those companies. Um, in particular, some of the some of the dynamics that go into us uh, selecting companies is one: we do have to talk to the management teams. Uh, two, we uh, we we base our decisions on who we include, uh, on how the companies are performing, on how their competitors are uh, are are discussing those companies, their performance, uh, how uh, other industry contacts talk about those companies. And then um, uh, we we track their hiring and uh, and and how they've uh, you know other metrics that we can uh, we can gauge them by. Got it. Okay, so I dug into the report a little bit and tried to sum summarize a, a few key takeaways. So let's take a look at those. And if if you allow me, just set up the points and then I'll ask you to add some color. So the first two things that really you know jumped out, and I want to comment on are the perspectives of the technology companies, and then of course the other side is the buyers. So it seems that the pandemic really got startups to sharpen their focus. I remember talking to a number of VCs early on in the shutdown and they were all over their portfolio companies to reset their ICP, their ideal customer profile and sharpen their UVP, their unique value proposition. And they wanted them to do that specifically in the context of the pandemic and the new reality. And then on the buy side, let's face it, if you were in a digital business, you were out of business. So, <laughs> Picking up on those two thoughts, Eric, what can you share with us in terms of the findings that you have? 
Well, that's, that's very uh, consistent with what we had found. Uh, basically, um, when the pandemic first, when the lockdown came uh, in March, uh, we reached out to quite a few companies and industry contacts at that time. Um, feedback was, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was a period of great uncertainty and a lot of, um, a lot of uh, uh, budgets were, uh, were tightened pretty quickly. But it didn't take very long, and a lot of these companies, uh, you know, having been uh, innovation engines and, and emerging players, what they found was that uh, the broader market quickly adopted uh, digital transformation in response to the pandemic. Uh, basically, that was how they they uh, facilitated uh, keeping their their doors open, so to speak. And so um, the ones that were able to uh, to leverage uh, need for emerging technologies because of an acceleration in digital transformation, uh, they they really stepped up. And and quite a few of these companies, they kept hiring, they kept uh, their sales uh, did very well, and uh, and ultimately um, a lot of the VCs that had been uh, putting on the brakes, uh, they actually stepped up and uh, and and continued funding uh, pretty generously. Yeah, and we've got some data on that that we want to look into. So thank you for that. Now let's take a look at some of the, the, the specific data of the study, just try to break that down. The Elite 80 raised more than $3 billion last year, eclipsing the previous highs in your studies of 2019. And then a big portion of that capital went to a pretty small number, only 10 of the 80 firms. And, and most of that went to cybersecurity plays. So what do you make of these numbers, especially you know, given your history with, with this group of elite companies and the high concentration this year, this past year? So one of the trends that we've seen um, in, the public, in the public market or the IPO uh, market is um, companies are, are waiting till they're a little bit more mature than they used to be. So what we've seen is um, the, the funding for companies, uh, the, the larger rounds are far larger than they used to be. These companies typically are waiting till they're of size, you know, maybe now they're waiting to be uh, 200 million uh, in annual salary, in annual revenues versus uh, 100 million before. And so they are consuming quite a bit, lar the, the, the larger rounds are, are much bigger than they used to be. Um, in the in the most recent uh, report that we published, we had uh, one round that was over half a billion, and another one that was over 400 million. And if you go back just a couple or few years ago, uh, a, a large round was over 100 million, and uh, and you didn't get too many that were over 200 million. So that's that's been a distinct change, and and, and I think that's not necessarily just a function of the pandemic, uh, but I think the pandemic. Um, uh, caused uh, caused some companies to kind of step up the size of their rounds. Uh, and so there were a handful of, uh, of very large rounds, uh, f certainly bigger than what we'd ever seen before. Yeah, those are great observations. I mean, you're right. It was a hundred million used to be the magic number to go public. And now you get so much late money coming in, locking in maybe smaller gains, but giving that company, uh, you know, a little more time to get their act together pre IPO. Let's take a look at where the money went. You know, like talking about follow the money and, and Eric, you and your team, you segmented that $3 billion into a number of different categories. As I said, most of it going to cybersecurity uh, categories like application security, assessment and risk, and this endpoint, endpoint boomed during the pandemic. Same with identity. And this chart really shows those categories that you created to better understand these dynamics and sort of figure out where the money went. How did you come up with these, these categories and what does this data tell you? So these categories were basically uh, homegrown. These are how I, um, I think of these companies. Um, it's uh, a little bit of uh, pulling some information out of uh, the likes of Gartner, but uh, for the most part, this was how I, how I conceptualized the landscape uh, in my mind. Um, the interesting thing to me is, you know, so. M m a lot of that data is skewed by a few large transactions. So, um, you know, if you if you think about the the, the allocation of those uh, those different categories and the, and the uh, investments in those categories, it's it's skewed by large transactions. And what was most interesting to me was 
Uh, one, um, the application security space is a space that had quite a few additional uh, smaller rounds, and I think that's one that's pretty interesting going forward. And then the one that was a surprise to me more than that was uh, the data management. Um, outside of cybersecurity, uh, data management is a space that's getting uh, a lot more attention and, uh, and it's getting um, uh, some pretty good uh, growth. So that's a space that we're, uh, we're paying some good, good attention to as well. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, of course, data management it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and VCs throwing money at it, maybe yep. trying to define it. And then, and then the the AI ops and 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 the, the that data management piece, you know, took a took a portion of it. But wow, the the cyber guys really are are, are killing it. And now, as we mentioned, ten companies sucked up the lion's share of of the funding. And this next chart shows that concentration of those ten investments. So Eric, some big numbers here with you know, one trust secured more than a half a billion dollars, four others nabbed more than a quarter billion in funding. Give us your thoughts on this. What do you make of that high concentration? Well, um, I, I think this is a function of, uh, of companies that are waiting uh, longer than they used to. Um, these, these companies are getting to be of considerable scale. I mean, Tanium would be a good example. That's a company that could have gone public years ago, and uh, and I don't think they're particularly eager to get out the door. Uh, they provide liquidity to their previous investors by raising money and uh, and and buying those shares back, um, and so they uh, they basically uh, just continue to uh, to grow uh, without the uh, the burden or or the, um, uh, the the demands that being a public company create. Um, so there's this, that's, that's really a function of, uh, of companies just waiting longer before they get out the door. Got it. Now here's another view of that, that data. The, so the left side of this chart uh, that, that we, we, we want to show you next um, gives you a sense of the size of the companies, the revenue in the elite 80. And you know, most of these companies have broken through the hundred million dollar revenue mark, as you say, uh, uh, and, and they're, they're still private. And so, you can see the breakdown and then the right-hand side of the chart shows the most active investors. We just pulled out those with three or more transactions. And it's, it's interesting to see the players there. And of course, you've got some strategics, you got Citi in there, you've got Cisco, along with a little bit of P&E, uh, uh, private equity action. Maybe your thoughts on, on, on this data. So, so to give you a little flavor uh, around the, uh, the size of these companies, when we first started publishing this report, uh, a little bit of the goal was to try to keep those categories relatively equal. And as you can see, they've skewed uh, far to the left uh, towards the, uh, to the larger revenue street, you know, size. So that's, that just goes to the point that um, uh, the, the companies that, uh, you know, that are getting the, a lot of these private companies, uh, they're, they're of si considerable size before they, uh, they really go out the door. And, and I think that's, a reflection of, um, of the caliber of, uh, of or the quality of investments that, uh, that are out there today. These are companies that have built very mature businesses and they're not going into the market until, um, until they can demonstrate uh, high confidence and, uh, and consistency in their performance. Yeah, I mean, you saw, I remember when, when Cloudera took that massive, I think it was $750 billion or a, a million dollar investment from, uh, from Intel you know, way back when, they, that bridged them to IPO. And that was sort of, if I recall, started that, that trend. And then now you get a you know, IPO last year, like Snowflake, which is priced to perfection. And you got guys that really know how to do this. They've done it a number of times. And so it really has somewhat changed that, that dynamic uh, for IPOs, which of course came booming back. It was so quiet there for so many years, but let's look into these markets a bit. Um, I want to talk about the security space and the IT infrastructure space. And here's a chart from Optiv, which is one of the elite 80, ironically. And we've yep. shared this with, with our audience before. And the point of this is that the cyber security space is it's highly fragmented. We've reported on this a lot. It's got hundreds and hundreds of companies in there. It's this mosaic of solutions. So very complicated and bespoke sets of tooling. And combine that with a lack of skilled expertise. You know, CISOs tell us the lack of talent is their biggest challenge makes it a really dynamic market. And Eric, this is part of the reason why VCs, they want in. So the takeaway I get from that chart is we have a lot of, um, we still have a great need for best of breed. Um, digital transformation, uh, cloud, uh, mobile, 
all these trends are creating such a disruption that there's still a great opportunity for somebody that can deliver a uh, you know a real best of best of breed um, uh, solution uh, in spite of uh, all the challenges that uh, ID, IT departments are having with trying to uh, to meet you know security requirements and things like that uh, the the world has embraced uh, you know digital delivery and uh, you are your success is oftentimes dependent on your your digital differentiation and if that's the case then there's always going to be opportunity for a better technology out there so that's that in the end is uh, is why uh, Optiv has a uh, a line card that's uh, as <laughs> as long as you can read it I'm glad you brought up the point about best of breed. It's an age old debate in the industry as do we go best of breed or do we go you know, integrated suites? You, know, you look at a company like Microsoft, obviously that, that works very well for them. Uh, companies like Cisco, but so this next uh, uh, set of data, we're going to bring in some ETR customer spending data and, and see where that momentum is. And I think it'll really underscore the points that you're making there in terms of best of breed. So this chart shares a popular view that we like to, to share with our community. On the vertical axis is net score, or that's spending velocity. And the horizontal axis shows market share or pervasiveness in the data. As we've said before, anything above 40%, that red line on the vertical axis is considered elevated. And you can see a lot of companies in cybersecurity are above that mark. Now, a couple points I want to make here before we bring Eric back in. First is the market, it's fragmented, but it's pretty large at over $100 billion, depending on which you know, research firm you look at, it's growing at you know, the low double digits. So, so nice growth, you know, it's putting on $10 billion a year in, into that number. And there are some big pure plays like Palo Alto Networks and Fortinet, but the market includes some other large whales like Cisco, uh, they've built up a sizable security business, Microsoft, Microsoft is in most markets and, and, and serves its you know, software customers. So, but you can see how crowded this market is. Now we've superimposed in the red, recent valuations for some of the companies. And, and the other point we want to make is, there's some big numbers here and some divergence between, as Eric was saying, the, the best of breed and the integrated suites. And the pandemic, as we've talked about a lot, is, is fueled a shift in cyber strategies toward endpoint identity and cloud. And, you can see that in CrowdStrike's $50 billion plus valuation. Okta, another best of breed, $34 billion in identity. They just bought Auth0 and paid $4.5 billion for Auth0 to get access to the developer community. Zscaler at $28 billion. Proofpoint is going private at a $12 billion number. So you can see why VCs are pouring money into this market, some really attractive valuations. Eric, what are your thoughts on this data? So my interpretation is that's that's just further validation that uh, that these security markets are uh, are getting disrupted and uh, and the, the truth of the matter is there's only one um, really well positioned uh, platform player in there uh, uh, Palo Alto uh, the rest of them are uh, are platforms within their respective uh, security technology space but uh, you know there's there's not very many. Um, you know, broad security solution providers today. And the reason for that is because we've got such a, uh, a transformation going on uh, across uh, technology that the need for best of breed is, uh, is, is getting recognized uh, day in, day out. Yeah, you're right, Palo Alto, they, CISOs love to work with Palo Alto. They're kind of the high end gold standard, but, and we reported last year on the divergence in valuations between Fortinet and Palo Alto Networks. Fortinet was doing a better job you know, pivoting to the cloud. We said Palo Alto will get its act together, it did. But then you see these pure play best of breeds really you know, doing well. So now let's take a look at the IT infrastructure space. And it's, it's quite different um, in terms of the dynamics of the market. So here's that same view of the ETR data and we've cut it by uh, three categories. We, we cut on networking, servers and storage. And this is a very large market. It's, 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 it's over $200 billion, but it's much more of an oligopoly in, in that you've got great concentration at the top. You've got some really big companies like Cisco and Dell, which is spinning out VMware. So we're going to unlock you know, more value of the core Dell company. Dell's valuation is 79 billion. And that includes its 80% ownership in VMware. So you, you do the math and figure out what core Dell is worth. HPE is much smaller. It's notable that its valuation is comparable 
to NetApp. NetApp's around you know, one fifth the size of uh, revenue wise, uh, HPE. Now, Eric, Arista, they stand out as the lone player yeah. that's having some success clearly against Cisco. What are your thoughts on, on the infrastructure space? So, so a couple things I'll take away from that. Now, first off, uh, you mentioned Arista. Arista is a bit of an anomaly. Um, a, a switching company, you know, a networking company that is in that upper uh, echelon, like you've uh, pointed out above 40%, it is, it is unique. And, and basically they kind of cracked the code. They figured out how to beat Cisco at, at Cisco's core competency, which is traditionally switching, switching and routing. And they, they did that by delivering a very differentiated uh, uh, hardware product um, that, that they were able to tap into some markets that, uh, that even Cisco hasn't been able to open up. And, and those would be the hyperscale, uh, hyperscale uh, um, you know, hosting vendors uh, like uh, uh, Google and Facebook and Microsoft. Um, but I would, I would put, I would put uh, Arista kind of in a, uh, in a unique situation. The other thing that I'll just point out that I think is an interesting takeaway from the, um, from the, 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 the slide that you showed is there are some uh, infrastructure or what I would consider bordering on data management type companies. I mean, you look at uh, Rubrik, you look at Cohesity and Nutanix, uh, Veeam, they're, they're all kind of bubbling up there and, uh, and pure storage. And I think that comes back to what I was mentioning earlier, where there is some pretty interesting innovation going on in data management, which has traditionally not had a lot of innovation. So I would bet you uh, those names would have bubbled up just in the last uh, year or two, uh, where that's been a market that hasn't had a lot of innovation. And, and now there's some interesting things coming down the pipe. You know, that's interesting comments that you're making there because if you think back to sort of last decade, Arista obviously broke out. The only two other companies in the, in the core infrastructure space, and this was a hardware game historically, but it's obviously becoming a software game, but take a look at Pure Storage and Nutanix, you can see their valuations at, at 5 billion and $7.4 billion respectively. Uh, and then to your point, Cohesity, you got them at, at 3.7 billion, just did a recent you know, round rubric, 3.3 billion, that's from 2019. And so, you know, was, presumably that's a higher valuation now. Veeam got taken out last January at 5 billion by uh, Inside Capital. Uh, and so I think they're doing very well and they're probably uh, uh, up from that. And SUSE is going public at, uh, at, a, at a reported $7 billion valuation. So quite a bit different dynamic in the infrastructure space. So Eric, I want to bring it back to the Elite 80. And, 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 and startups in general. My first question to you is, is what do you look for from successful startups to make this elite 80 list? So a few factors. First off, uh, their performance is, uh, is, is one of the primary uh, situations. If it's a company that's not growing, uh, we'll, we'll probably pull it from the list. Um, I would say it is also very much a function of my perception of the quality of management. Uh, we, we do meet with all these management teams. Um, if we feel like uh, they're, they're, they're putting together a, a, you know, a, um, uh, a leadership team that's going to be around for a long time and they've got a, a product position that's uh, pretty attractive, uh, th those would certainly be two key aspects of, of what I look for. Beyond that, uh, certainly feedback that we get from competitors, uh, feedback that we get from industry contacts like resellers. And then, um, and then I'd also just say uh, my enthusiasm for their respective market that they're in. If it's a, a market that I think is, is going to be difficult or flat or not very interesting, then, then that would certainly be a, um, uh, a reason to, to not include them. Uh, conversely, even if it's a small company, if it's a, if it's a sector that I think is going to be uh, around for quite a while and it's very differentiated, uh, then we'll include um, a lot of the smaller companies too. Well, a good example of that's like a Weka. I mean, we're, I don't want to I don't want to yeah. go into these companies, but too because we leave we, 80 companies are going to leave somebody out. But that that's a good example of a smaller company that looks yeah. to be disruptive. Um, how should enterprise customers, the buyers, do you think evaluate and filter? startups. Do you have any sense of that? 
Well, um, a couple things that I struggle with that that would be, uh, you know, something that's a lot more readily available to them is uh, is just the quality of the product. I mean, that's obviously uh, why why they're looking at it. But uh, if it's a uh, if it's a company that's got a a unique product that uh, is is built, uh, you know, that 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 can that can that works. That would be the starting point. And then, and then beyond that, it's also is it a management team? Is is the behavior of the company something that uh, reflects a management team that's uh, that's that's you know a high quality management team? If they if they you know are responsive, if they're uh, following up, if they're um, uh, not trying to pull in business uh, quickly, if they're priced appropriately, uh, metrics like that would certainly be um, key aspects that would be readily available to, uh, to the, you know, to the, the, the buyers of technology. Beyond that, um, uh, you know, I think the viability of that market is going to be uh, a key aspect uh, as to whether or not that company is going to be around, even if it's a good company. If uh, if it's a uh, highly competitive uh, market that's going to have some big uh, big players that can uh, kind of integrate it into make it a feature across other other product lines, then that's going to make it a, a tough a tough road to to, to go for a, a startup these days. You know the other thing I wanted to to, to talk about was the risks and the rewards of of working with with startup companies, and I've had. I've had CIOs and, and, and enterprise architects tell me that they'll, when, when they have to do an RFP, they'll pull out the Gartner Magic Quadrant. They'll always you know, pick a couple in the top right just to cover their butts. But they, many say, you know what? We also pick some of those, those in the challenger space because, because that, are, that are really interesting to us and, and we run them through the paces and we manage those risks. We don't, <laughs> we don't run the company on them, but it helps us find these diamonds in the rough, I mean, think about you know in the in the, in the second part of last decade, if you picked a snowflake, you might have been able to get ahead of some of your competition yeah. and things like data sharing, or or maybe you found that that well, you know what, Okta is going to help me with my, my identity in, in in a new way, and we're going to be better prepared to be a digital business. But do you have any thoughts on how uh, uh, people should manage those risks and and how should they should think about the upside? I don't I don't think today. Um, a a um, you know a, a company can work today using legacy technologies. I, I think the risk, the greater risk, is falling behind from a uh, a digital transformation perspective. Uh, this this era, I think the pandemic is probably the best proof point of this. Um, you can't you can't go with just a uh, a, a traditional uh, legacy architecture in a uh, in in a key aspect of your business. And so the startups, um, I, I think you've got to take the quote unquote risk of working with a startup that's, uh, you know, that, that's got a viability concern or sustainability concern, uh, the risk of, of having a, um, uh, an IT infrastructure that's inadequate is, uh, is a far greater risk from my perspective. So I think that the startups right now are, um, are, are in a very strong position. And they're well funded. And that's the last sort of question I wanted to talk about is how will startups kind of penetrate the enterprise in, in this modern era? I mean, you know, this is really a, a software world and software is this sort of capital efficient business, but yet you're seeing companies raise hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, that's not even absurd these days. You see companies go to IPO that have raised over a billion dollars. And much of that, if not most of it goes to promotion and go to market. Uh, so so how, how, maybe you could, to give us your perspectives on how you see startups getting into the enterprise in these sectors. So I, one of the really interesting things that we've seen in the last couple of years is a lot of changes to uh, sales models. And, and if you look at the mid market, um, the ability to leverage viral uh, sales models uh, has been wildly successful for some companies. Um, it's been, um, you know, a great strategy. Uh, there's a, a, a public company, Ubiquity, that did a uh, has, has built a, a multi-billion-dollar uh, you know business on on uh, without without a sales organization. So there's some pretty interesting um, directions that I think uh, sales and go-to-market is going to uh, in, incur over the over the coming years. Uh, traditional enterprise sales, I think, are still uh, pretty standard today, but I, I think that 
the efficiency of um, of you know social networking and and uh, and and what would the the delivery of uh, of products on a, on a digital for, uh, in a digital format is going to change the way that we do sales. So I think I think there's a lot of efficiencies that are going to come in uh, in sales over the coming years. That's interesting because then you'll. You know, I, I think you're right. And, 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 and instead of just, just pouring money at promotion, maybe get more efficient there and pour money in, into to engineering because that yes. really is the long-term sustainable value that these companies are going to create, right? Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with that. And um, uh, again, if you look at the, you know, if you look at the charts of the well-established players that, uh, that you had mentioned, those companies are where they are. That the ones at the top are where they are because of their technology. I mean, it's it's not because of uh, their go to market. It's 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 because they have something that other people can't uh, can't replicate. Right. Well, Eric, hey, it's been great having you on today. Thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time. Well, Dave, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. So uh, so thank you. All right, hey, go get the Elite Eighty report. All you got to do is search JMP Elite 80 and it'll, it'll come up. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of data out there. So it's really a worthwhile reference tool. And uh, so thank you everybody for watching. Remember these episodes are all available as podcasts wherever you listen. You can check out ETR's website at etr.plus. And we also publish weekly a full report on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. You can email me david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me on Twitter at dvellante. Uh, hit, our, hit our LinkedIn post and Really appreciate those comments. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE Insights powered by ETR. Have a great week, everybody stay safe and we'll see you next time.